Good morning. And thank you for joining HLB's International Tax Webinar on Global Mobility Tax Residency. This is one of a series of webinars put on by the HLB International Tax Committee with the help of our HLB members around the world. And um, at the end, I'll be telling you some of the other ones that you can find online and re-listen to. But today, we are talking about tax, global mobility and tax residency. I will be moderating the, show, the webinar, and we are joined by three of our experts from around the world. First, we have Kevin Bunting. Kevin, would you please introduce yourself? Good morning or afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Kevin Bunting. I am a tax partner for Lovewell Blake, based in the United Kingdom. Great, and we are also joined by Jared Johnson. Jared? Sorry, I had to get myself off of mute. Good morning, everyone. Uh, oh. My name is Jared Johnson, and I am uh, the Director of Global Mobility uh, Services for Ide Bailey out of uh, the United States. And finally, we have Julianne Lang. Hi there. Good morning and good afternoon. This is Julianne Lange speaking from HLV Stückmann in Bielefeld. I'm a um, certified tax advisor and tax lawyer and uh, working also with HLV International. Great. So we thought we'd start by just saying, what is global mobility? And so global mobility refers to kind of a large group of events or uh, consultation services when you have multinational corporations or even small corporations that send their employees around the world to different countries. So when an employee is asked to move abroad, it's called an international assignment. And as we it, as we provide international assignment services, it's the process that we work with employees and the employers to talk about their expatriate payroll, their compensation and benefits, their rewards, immigration, and certainly tax issues, including equalization. Today, we're going to focus on tax residency and how a, an employee establishes or becomes a resident of a host country and what are some of the issues around all of what the employee might face. We'll start with a question of what constitutes tax residency. And before I jump on to Julienne, I would like to ask the participants if you could answer, if you are willing to, if you could answer each of these questions for your country and then put that in an email to me, we will develop a matrix that answers all of these questions across as many countries as participate. So I'll, I'll remind you about this again at the end, but again, try to answer this for your own. So Julian, why don't you get us started off? What constitutes residency in Germany? Thank you, Kimberly, for this wonderful introduction. Well, now what effectively may constitute a tax residence for a natural person in Germany, it's mainly characterized by three criteria. The main one is the fixed domicile, that means an address where the person is actually disposing of room and living there under conditions that allow the conclusion that this person is permanently living there. So if the family in Germany is keeping room for you and um, you regularly visit them, this is not a fixed domicile and not presence. And the so-called standby apartments where the disposition is not guaranteed is also not a fixed domicile. Coming to the second very important character is the presence. The presence above six months is meaning the physical presence of a natural person in Germany over a period of continuously six months. This is not necessarily to be taking place within the calendar year, but um, it is regardless of the initial intention that, for instance, an employer or an employee had to stay here more than six months, it is merely relevant what in the end he stayed here, how for the time he, he finally stayed here. And 
The last alternative is kind of special regulation for persons uh, living just across the border in Germany and working here in order to get them certain allowances and tax um, um, credits, tax advantages, uh, similar to those working and living in Germany, there's a possibility for them to apply to be resident here. So that's it for Germany. Kevin, how is it for Great Britain? Thanks, Julia. The UK has a, what we call a statutory residence test. So it gives us a framework to, to work within to understand whether someone is an income tax, capital gains tax, or what we call inheritance tax resident. So the, the easiest two are you either statutorily tax resident, and there are generally four tests. I won't give all the detail of each, but fundamentally they operate around the number of days in the UK. If you exceed 183 days, you are automatically resident. Another one is very similar to Germany around fiscal presence. If you have a home, family and other ties to the UK, then you're automatically resident. Uh, and then on the other side, you have automatically not UK resident. And that can be where you're working full time overseas under a contract of employment or you're physically not in the UK. In most cases, the UK finds itself where taxpayers are moving around and they don't fall easily into either of those two categories. So we come down to what we call a ties test. The ties test basically says to us, that if you meet so many of these ties, you're allowed to be present in the UK for a set number of days. If you exceed that number of days, then you are tax resident for the UK tax year, which is 6th of April to the following 5th of April. When you count days, you only look at those where you're actually here at midnight um, and you can discard any other days that you're not. This can sometimes be used for planning purposes, but not as much as it used to be a few years ago when you, you could ignore your day of arrival and your day of departure. They're fundamentally the, the requirements for looking at when someone is tax resident. We do have other more complicated tests around temporary absence and other bits and, and pieces that I won't go into. And the UK also recognizes the, the treaty position, the OECD model, um, where you can actually be resident somewhere else in priority to the UK, but you'll still need to consider the statutory residence test if that does apply. I think that's a pretty brief summary, and um, I'll hand over to, I believe, Jared in, in the US. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, in the United States, uh, we tend to look at uh, maybe not where you're, where you're uh, center of vital interests are so much when you try to determine residency. First and foremost, um, it's important to highlight that U.S. citizens, even if they may be living outside of the United States, are, are residents of the United, are, are considered residents of the United States and taxed on worldwide income, which we'll go into a little bit later. Um, if uh, an individual has a U.S. green card, then they meet the permanent residence test and would be considered a resident of the United States. Uh, the next test that we look at is what we call the substantial presence test. And this is a little bit more complicated, where you look at an individual's, uh, the number of days that they've spent in the U.S. And if they've spent at least 31 days in the United States, uh, then you basically it's like a three year look back rule where you count up the number of days and take all of your current year days, a third of the year before that and a sixth of the year before that. And if the sum of that formula add up to 183 days or more, then you've established residency under the substantial presence test. Um, a good rule of thumb that we use uh, for helping people know if they've tripped the substantial presence test is have they spent more than 120 days in the last three years uh if they if they spent more than 180 120 days in each of the last three years then you're very close of meeting and likely uh, met the substantial presence test uh, another uh tricky part of establishing residency is once you've met the substantial presence test what date does your residency start date begin and end? 
uh, for those years in which you enter the United States or depart the United States. Uh, there's some uh, complicated rules which we won't go into today uh, for this, uh, but there's uh, there's a 10 day de minimis rule and, and trying to determine what exactly that date is and why that's important is, is probably a topic all in, unto itself. But as far as this goes, this is a, a good overview of what residency constitutes in the United States. Thank you, Jared. And um, just to emphasize, it's important that the United States is the only, one of very few, if not the only country that will tax its US residents and permanent residents on their worldwide income, no matter where in the world they are living. So if you are one of the top two, the US citizen or a green card holder, you, you have to report your, ta in, your worldwide income to the IRS every year. Which gets us to how are the individuals taxed in all of these various countries? So here, we'll start with Kevin. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, the UK actually does have a very complicated system, but holistically, it's actually quite straightforward to understand. If you are what we call a domicile to the UK, this is somebody perhaps who's lived here all their lives or their father was born here, for example. It doesn't matter. They're tax resident, their worldwide, worldwide income and capital gains are accessible in the UK. This is the ordinary test. There is a subsequent test for those that can be considered non-domiciled. And this classically happens where you have um, mobility within the workforce because the normal UK tests for domicile are, are normally uh, passed. So on that basis, they can elect what we call the remittance basis. And this basically means they pay income tax on their UK source income and income and capital gains tax on the income and capital they bring to the UK from somewhere else. Days gone by, the non-DOM rule, as we call it, was um, very well used, uh, but the rules in the last few years have tightened it up so that it's not so attractive for those coming to the UK to elect for this system. For the very wealthy, it still is, albeit very complicated, but for the average person who is moving from one country to another, for employment purposes, you'll generally find they will not elect for this basis because the loss of, say, a personal allowance, which is the first part of their employed income, which doesn't attract tax, is actually too much of a disincentive for them to consider the alternative route. However, it should always be reviewed before somebody comes to the UK to understand which basis will be better for them. For the first seven years at a uh, someone arrives in the UK from another country, they don't pay a charge for benefiting from the remittance basis, but thereafter they will. I'm just going down my slide. The other fact to look at is when you see how income tax is deducted in the UK, in most cases, the, the, the pay-as-you-earn system will collect money from their UK salary, but if they're still being paid out of the host country, let's say because there is no requirement to have a UK payroll, there'll be no tax deducted at source. On this concept, sometimes the individual will need to register for PAYE in their own name to operate the system to collect the income tax. Or alternatively, they'll have to file a tax return after the end of the tax year in which they arrived, and this will declare the income and the tax will then be paid a year or so later. Under that process, however, the second year that you are in the UK, your tax bill will be split in two, so you are due to pay tax in advance. So therefore, if you don't pay for, say, a 12-month period, you will find yourself paying tax over an 18-month period when you make your first tax payment on income that you haven't actually earned because you haven't been here for the full 18 months at that point in time. I appreciate that sounds a bit complicated, but what the UK is trying to do is get somebody who's in arrears into paying up front and because of that, there's a catch-up time frame in which that happens. That's crudely how an individual coming to the UK will be taxed on their employment income. Other income, you would then need to look at the remittance basis to see what would occur. I think with that, um, I can hand over to Jared again, I believe. Yes, thank you, Kevin. So, as uh, Kimberly stated, a little bit earlier, uh, 
the United States is unique in the way that it taxes uh, citizens, green card holders, and residents of the United States, regardless of uh, where they're at in the world, uh, they are taxed on a worldwide income basis. Uh, this surprises many people. Uh, I talk to many people on a regular basis uh, that might be considered what you call an accidental uh, citizen of the United States. Maybe they've been living overseas or outside the United States for their entire lives, but they were born um, in the United States, or maybe they were born uh, to uh, one of their parents is a U.S. citizen, which would automatically make them a citizen of the United States. This complicates things because uh, if you are born to a, a citizen, you are a citizen of the United States, and it surprises a lot of people that they should be filing an, a tax return every year reporting worldwide income. Uh, so this is uh, very surprising to people, and uh, both professionals and non-professionals alike. So the same uh, for US green card holders. Uh, they are taxed on, a, on worldwide income as well, regardless of where they're at. Um, if they have a green card, uh, work in the U.S. for several years and they return back to their home country, uh, they continue to be taxed on a worldwide regime until they relinquish that green card, both uh, for tax purposes. Uh, just merely relinquishing your green card for immigration purposes is not sufficient. Uh, you have to file a final tax return. Uh, with the United States indicating that you are relinquishing your, your green card. Um, and then what we talked about in the earlier slide is substantial presence test uh, rule. People who meet that rule are also taxed on worldwide income. So that residency start date is very important because that's when you determine when you start reporting income on a worldwide basis. Uh, U.S. non-residents uh, sir, or non-residents of the United States. Uh, they are not taxed on worldwide income, but they're only taxed on U.S. source income. And uh, as just a general, this is a general overview of, of U.S. taxation. So it gets a little bit more complicated. We'll get into a few more questions that talk about U.S. taxation, but this is a good overview of how they are taxed overall. And I think, uh, I'll turn the time over uh, to Julianne now to talk about Germany. Yes, thank you, um, <clears throat> Jared. Well, once for all, Germany is quite simple in comparison to the US, I think. Well, we have mainly, <laughs> mainly one um, uh, principle, which is that um, if you are resident here, either based on presence or on um, um, place of living, then you're fully taxable on your worldwide income. And if you're not resident, it's just the uh, income from German source that is taxable. Um, and if we look at the income regarding those for an assignment, that might be that the employer is German or that the company uh, having its seat and um, management abroad is having a permanent establishment here then the source uh, with an assignment ca might come from Germany. Um, then we have what we call extended tax liability. That is kind of special tax liability for those um, nationals, mainly Germans who lived here at least five years within a period, within a period of 10 months and then move to lower tax countries or move to Great Britain, taking care of the remittance base. And um, then they have to face a low, uh, a special tax treatment here because principally they are only um, taxable on a limited tax liability. However, the Germans don't really like um, money and income sources going abroad especially not when the tax uh, right goes uh, to another country. Uh, so they, uh, under certain conditions, take the grip on um, certain 
um, values and sources of income that wouldn't be applicable to a pure limited tax level liability. Very special scheme indeed. So, and finally, the tax liability for diplomats and those um, working cross-border um, on application to be resident. These are also taxed on a worldwide income similar to regular residents. That's it for Germany. And Great, thank, thank you, Julian. Um, so now when we have um, a dual residency, so we've talked about residency in one country and how you establish that, but frequently you might end up being considered a resident of two different countries, especially from a US perspective. So we're gonna start how, answering this question of how do you avoid double taxation when you're, you're a dual resident? So I'll turn this over to Jared. Yeah, so um, from a US perspective, I'll, I'll kind of take this slide on a little bit backwards uh, because right, we're mostly talking about people that are um, where the host country is the United States in this scenario. So when you have an individual that come into the United States uh, to work and they meet the substantial presence test, there are ways to get out of residency in those scenarios if they're on a short-term assignment. And that would be um, mainly using a tax treaty uh, if they, and if you're from a treaty country. And so a lot of times there's a, there's an article under the treaty called the uh, dependent personal services or independent personal services, which you can use to get out of uh, taxation in the U.S. In, in that scenario, if you meet a, a few different um, uh, things, uh, a lot of times you have to be on you have to be on payroll in the home country. All of your expenses from that assignment have to be borne by that home country entity, and you can't be in the U.S. A lot of times, it, it, the treaties vary depending on country. But it could vary between a rolling 12 month period and a 12 month period uh, or just a calendar year period. So uh, there are ways to get out of it. But most of the time when you're in the United States and you're earning money in the United States, the US will have the first right of taxation on that income. And the, really the only way of getting out of that would be through a tax treaty. And um, so that, that dependent personal services is, is, is a good article to do. And there's also some other, we'll talk about this in the treaty section a little bit more too, but there's a, um, a treaty tiebreaker clause you can use to get out and, and also a closer connection under the Internal Revenue Service Code uh, that you can use to get out of residency as well. Uh, the, the unique thing about the United States, though, as we've kind of alluded to, or, or the taxation of U.S., uh, it, um, and unlike most, I, I think m most or if not all countries, we tax on a worldwide regime for citizens and green card holders. And so the opposite is true in the United States. When you have an expat leaving the United States and going to work in a foreign country, they have a an obligation to report worldwide income while they're on a foreign international work assignment. So the question often comes up is, well, how do I get out of uh, double taxation then? Because if I go work in, a, in Germany, Germany is going to have the first try of taxing that income. And even though the U.S. taxes on a worldwide regime, so the U.S. is, is aware of this and they will allow, you know, Germany to tax be the have the first right of taxation so they've instituted a couple ways to get out of double taxation and that is the first and and most common way and most people will hear about this is the foreign earned income exclusion so the u.s allows an exclusion of in 2020 107 thousand six hundred dollars of foreign earned income if you met meet the following test the tax home test physical presence test or the bona fide residence test. So every, in order to meet the, or the, for, the foreign earned income exclusion, you have to have a tax home outside the US. And then you have to meet one or the other, the physical presence or the bona fide residence test. So the, the physical presence is the one that's most widely known. And that's where you have to be 
um, present in a foreign country or outside the U.S. for 330 days during any 12-month period. So you can't have more than 35 days back into the United States or you blow the physical presence test and you wouldn't be eligible for this exclusion. Uh, the next is the bona fide residence test. So if you don't meet the physical presence test, uh, this is usually the fallback test. So, uh, and this is if your residence is outside the US for an uninterrupted period of one full calendar year. The reason this is the fallback is because this will extend your return basically about a year from when you can typically file a US tax return because you have to wait for the period, one full calendar year to pass where your residency is outside the US. So, um, if you don't meet one of these tests, uh, not all is lost. If you're taxed in the foreign country, then you can claim a foreign tax credit to offset your U.S. taxation, a dollar for dollar credit uh, to avoid double taxation. And there's also instances where you would use a combination. If your income is over the 107,600, then you can use a combination of the foreign tax credits and the foreign earned income exclusion. There's also situations where it's better to use the foreign tax credit versus the foreign earned income exclusion. And we would uh, optimize that, we optimize that in all of our filings with our clients to see which scenario is the best, claim the exclusion, the tax credits or a combination of both. Um, and so this is a, 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 a really um, all of the ways or a good summary of all the ways that we're trying to avoid double taxation. It gets kind of complicated for everyone, but I'll turn the time over to, to Kevin now to talk about the UK. Julianne, is that? Um... Oh, oh, did, oh, did I skip? I'm it, sorry. it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll... Okay. Okay. I just quickly swap in. There. No, uh, you have plenty of time. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no. Um, well, I was very uh, attentionally listening to to Jared because, um, well, uh, it's very similar. The, the Germans, national, following national law, they um, <clears throat> they are not really prepared uh, to to give relief if you have even if you have a dual residency. Uh, so it's very much uh, to rely on treaty also with Germany. If there's a dual residence, um, it, it should be best that the other country involved is a treaty country of a double tax treaty. And then um, effectively the double taxation is in most cases for, if we look here at, at wages, at, at employment income, then it's the exemption method that is applicable for German uh, double tax treaties and that is very favorable in most of the cases for employment income. So that's the main method to be applied here. If we um, look at those cases where there is no double tax treaty and we have only national German tax law, then in most of the cases Germany is not prepared to exempt uh, the, the foreign income from German taxation because they are afraid that the tax rate abroad is not high enough. And then they include it in a full uh, taxation of German um, assessment and they give a set off or tax credit of the tax paid in the other country or in these uh, in the other countries, whatever they may be. And um, the, the, spe the specific problem sometimes uh, shows up is precisely that the Germans are really formal uh, and and really uh, request the proof of taxation in the other country. And if the proof is not given, then the tax credit is is yeah it's not um, provided. Um, when we talk of um, exemption method, then sometimes comes the initiative uh, saying okay then maybe if you exempt my uh, my income from abroad and only uh, you have to determine it for the tax rate okay that's that's understood and maybe if i have negative income okay. so losses abroad and you take them into consideration for the german tax rate that might be of you know positive effect well in the end uh, believe me uh, effectively this doesn't work so the positive progression is taken by the German tax 
office, but the negative progression is in most cases only intended, but in most cases effectively excluded since the German tax office doesn't really like losses from abroad. So now is it for Kevin, I think. Thanks, Juliana. I'm glad you picked up Germany because I would have uh, I would have failed big big start if you'd have left me to try and talk about it. Um, <laughs> the UK. I think I'll start backwards on my slide, similar to Jared, and make the big point, which is the UK considers somebody either tax resident or not tax resident for a particular period. Therefore, we should always look to see whether somebody is or they aren't. It's not like the US, for example, where there is a roll-off system. Um, so it can be quite important to make sure that the person is deemed tax resident for this purpose. The next thing we would go to is the treaty. The, the UK has a number of treaties and actually the, the uh, government here or the Treasury are pretty good at monitoring them and ensuring that if someone is claiming treaty relief that they get the benefit for it and it flows through their tax returns fairly smoothly. Similar to Germany, if somebody was working outside of the UK and um, Come and, uh, and then having their income reported here. If they don't have a treaty position, then they would assess the income and give some credit for the tax that is being paid locally in the other country. What we need to watch, however, is it's quite common in certain sectors, say the oil and gas market, for example, where some of the multinational companies will just effectively have a withholding tax against the employed income that the person's generating, which goes into a pool that offsets taxes in, a, in other countries. The UK will give you no credit for that. You either have a bona fide certificate from the foreign country saying that the taxes have been paid, or effectively you don't get credit for them. It doesn't happen in all industries, but it certainly does in oil and gas, and similar to Germany, those with very low headline rates of income tax. If we move away from treaty, there are other areas that we can look at within the UK to see if somebody can overcome this being tax resident principle. The split year treatment the UK has, this basically says if somebody arrives in the UK partway through the year, they're not necessarily deemed automatically resident for that whole tax year. They can split that year like a cake. So part of it they are resident and part of it they're not. When doing this, it's possible to ignore the bit where they are not resident. There are requirements before you can qualify for the rule, but it is worth bearing in mind because it can be helpful for those that are transitioning between two, two countries. The other observation I want to make on this particular part where you do need advice from both countries when somebody's moving between the two, is it's not uncommon for some nations to forget, for want of a better word, being polite, the treaty position. So sometimes you will have to remind them that there is a treaty in place and that your uh, employee who's moving does qualify. And you need to make sure that both the host country and the other country that is being the, having the services performed are aware of what that treaty position is and, may, and, and, and dealing with it both sides of the equation. Outside of that, the, the UK is, is, is fundamentally quite straightforward. It, it's a very clean system. Once you know the outcome of whether you are or you are not tax resident, you do need to follow treaty and you need, do need to watch out that you are physically and tax somebody somewhere else and not under a treaty position. Um, I think similar to both other countries, you only get credit in the UK for tax you've physically paid over, overseas as well. So it, it's not good enough simply to say I have a liability pending. You physically have to pay it before your tax return is submitted. Great. Thank you, Kevin. We've spent a lot of time on this on these slides talking about dual residency, actually talking about the tax treaties. So we'll jump right into tax treaties with Julian. Julian, how do the treaties impact residency and the taxation of residents or people coming into Germany as a host as, as a host country? Well, thank you, Kimberly. Um, <clears throat> when when people come to Germany and well, we check from our, our national law whether this person is resident here. And first of all, we, we, we don't take the treaty into consideration. Only in a certain second um, step, we look into the treaty and see, okay, also in the other country, he might be a uh, resident there. And if a person has a residence in one country and a presence of 
one of more than six months in another country, then there are tie then he is resident under the treaty in both countries and the the double tax agreements with Germany generally have kind of tiebreaker rules. And these are the ones um, that have to be followed in a certain um well certain range and this shows that residence prevails presence and then we look if he has presence in or residence in both countries we look at his personal ties this includes his job ties his family um and and any other ties like um um yeah working uh, employment in in different or uh, other engagements and if he also has ties in in both countries then uh, it's the presence um that is kind of special case if he has no place at all so we skip this and then in most of cases it's finally the nationality that decides because um then uh, we stick to to the the country um where which nationality he has if he has another nationality than the countries he has now ties and who are connected with the double tax treaty then there is no really tiebreaker rule and the countries have to agree upon a solution for this so this is mainly the procedure followed by german double tax treaties and it generally goes quite well now kevin it's your turn i think thank you julianne I can be pretty quick, I think, here, because very similar to Germany, the, the UK will start with looking at its domestic residence policy first. And if that individual is tax resident, they're tax resident. You can then go to a treaty to understand what the treaty will say about who has the first taxing rights to the income. And from there, you will get your uh, position to understand if you're deducting the tax or not. That is fundamentally the system. There isn't much else to, to come about. The UK will look at its statutory residence test. As I said earlier, under those tests, you either are or you are not tax resident. If we are deemed you are tax resident, you just go to the treaty to understand if you have those taxing rights. The same tests as Germany outlined in their slide around uh, presence, domestic ties, nationality, economic interests, and those type of items will all be considered in the same order that was in the treaty slide for Germany. Um, and that's it, really. So I, I believe I can hand over to Jared. Thank you, Kevin. So um, when we look at US residency, we always look at uh, what the uh, Internal Revenue Service Code is. And before we get to the tax treaty, if they've met you know what we've determined what residency is and what we discussed earlier then we look you know are they a resident of that other country and if they are then how do we get them how do we work determine which country they're really a resident of and first we before we go to the treaty we look at um, the internal revenue service code which is uh, on the on the topic which is a uh, which is a reg that's listed here on the slide of 7701B. And you know, uh, the, the reason why we look here is because there's two really main things as A, you don't need to be a treaty country in order to benefit from this. Um, this is under the code section of the IRS. Uh, the main thing is, is you can't be in the US for more than 182 days. But it also looks at where the, your center of vital interests are, and, and it looks at are you are your center of vital interests closer to the home country or the U or the U.S. And if it's the home country, then we can use the closer connection to get them out of uh, uh, establishing residency in the United States and uh, not subject to reporting worldwide income, etc. The other reason why this is uh, why this is uh, interesting to do this rather than go to the treaty immediately would be because uh, as a claiming the treaty or the closer connection, you don't have the U.S. international informational reporting requirement like you would under a treaty tiebreaker. Uh, what that means is I'm just going to jump into this because I'll address this in a little bit. 
but the U.S. requires uh, its uh, residents and citizens and green card holders to report uh, their ownership of, of non-U.S. assets throughout the world. And if they if they um, hold assets outside the United States and they have to disclose it, a lot of it's informational reporting. Um, the reason why that's important is because if you don't report these, uh, there's significant civil penalties and sometimes criminal penalties for failure to file. And some of these reportings can get very complicated when you have individuals that come in from to the United States from a foreign country where they've had all of their investments outside the U.S., maybe their pensions, their everything is is out there outside the U.S. And so this international informational reporting becomes quite extensive. So overcoming that is a, can be a very big deal. Um, if they've spent more than 182 days in the US, then you can't file and break residency in the US under the closer connection. That's when you would go to the treaty tiebreaker if they are in a, re, in a treaty country. And the, the thing in the United States, we look at the treaty as trumping or or overruling the internal revenue service code so whatever the code says if the treaty the treaty will always break uh will win out on that and so again we look at the center of vital interest where they are are they, are they in the foreign country or are they in the united states if they're in the foreign country then we can get them out of residency in the u.s but again under using the treaty tiebreaker you have to report foreign bank account information. Um, when I say foreign, I mean non-US non -US bank account information and all the other myriad of international informa informational reporting that's required. And that wraps it up for the US. Great, thank you, Jared. Um, we're gonna touch on uh, something that we deal with frequently and it, it starts with the UK in my opinion. So we're going to start with Kevin on how do you deal with diverging tax years when you a taxpayer might have two different tax years? Well, as you allude to, Kimberly, the UK is relatively unique in that it has a bizarre tax year end. I could explain it, but I don't think people would be interested. Um, because it's the 5th of April here, and most other countries will have a calendar year, it creates opportunity, but equally, equally it creates pitfalls. So anyone coming to the UK does need to consider that impact and understand what they're going to do before committing to a, an employment contract or other in the United Kingdom. One thing we do have in our armory, although I'm noting from the, the German slides it doesn't work for them, is the remittance basis, which is a concept where if you don't, if you want to elect for this um, way of taxation, you don't have to declare your foreign income and gains as they arise, only if you remit them. So it can be a sensible way of overcoming or smoothing off the problems between uh, a UK tax year and a foreign tax year. Another thing we look at is, I alluded to it earlier, if you are paying tax somewhere else, correctly so, I'll, I'll add, then the UK will give you credit for it. So sometimes tax payment date can be important. Normally the UK income tax payment dates, if they're not being deducted at source, are January and July, and therefore, if you've got a, a liability arising on the 31st of January and you have a liability arising, let's say, in December in the United States, you can get credit for that so long as you have paid your liability in the United States. That can sometimes be quite use, useful as well. And then we have the, the split year treatment I alluded to earlier. Sometimes it can again work in the taxpayer's favour because it gives them a chance to ignore, for want of a better phrase, an element of the UK tax year because they physically weren't here and they weren't temporarily resident outside the United Kingdom to try and benefit from that rule. And finally, careful planning. Like with all countries, your day of arrival and departure can be quite critical. Um, you always start with whether you're present here in the UK for 183 days or more, but also if you are here under the, um, the ties test, you could be finding yourself with a capped number of days. And if you play it correctly, departing in the UK can be quite advantageous too. I think that's probably a very crude but broad summary of the UK position and, and something I would take away for all is if, if someone's coming here to the UK just to ensure you know at what point that is and perhaps have a bit of advice in advance 
just so you can marry it up to your domestic year end uh, for tax purposes. With that, I believe Jared is um, talking next. Yeah, uh, the United States is one of those countries that we tax on a calendar year basis. Um, what we generally see around this area, very rarely will we see it, but sometimes when you we have citizens working outside the United States in a country has a fiscal year like the UK or, or um, Australia or India, uh, sometimes what we will have are, are uh, citizens electing to change their their reporting year from a calendar year to a fiscal year and matching the the one of those countries year end dates. And I I've seldom seen this, but sometimes if you have really complicated situations, we might see it. Where we see most of this is really on the planning of foreign tax credits. Uh, the nice thing about the United States is we can claim a foreign tax credit either on a paid method or an accrued method. And so we can, uh, uh, generally the, the paid method is the preferred way that we want to do. So whatever is paid in a calendar year, we can claim. So we can usually do some planning around what is paid to, in order to maximize foreign tax credits. Um, and if, and if that doesn't work, then we can elect to do an approval method. Uh, but the thing to note about that is, is when, when you elected to go from pay to accrued, you can't ever go back. It, it's a it's a, a final election, so to speak, without getting permission from the Internal Revenue Services to go back. So that wraps it up for the US. Okay, um, coming back to Germany, <clears throat> well, um, as in the US, um, German income tax of natural persons is um, taxed on a calendar year basis. However, if you come to um, employees assignment um, and respective apportionment of wages or income um, from employment, um, um, then it has to be taken into account that effectively um, not only within the income tax assessment um, the 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 employer and the employee have to t have to think of um, the tax year and when it is taxable in the other country or in in Germany. However, this um, requires similar to, to both other countries, uh, planning in advance, but a planning also so much in advance that it is rather not the income tax assessment, but it has to be apportioned already when uh, we are doing the payroll in Germany or in Great Britain or in India or wherever. And during the current payroll, we have to take care that the um, respective part or apportionment that is either to be attributed to Germany or the, to the other country is um, exempt from the taxation EA from the payroll, so from the wage tax. So that as for German purposes, you have people on the payroll or you have them off the payroll because they are in UK. And then if you are if they are in UK, you relieve them in Germany from the payroll. This is important for the following purpose. German employees are very much used to get money back when they have done their income tax return. They don't really like it to have payments afterwards if they have only income from an employment income. If we do not apportion the, the income between Germany and the other country, especially Great Britain or India or Australia, which have different tax years, we have we might have um, serious reallocations of income, and um, that might cause either double tax for the employer in the wage tax deduction situation, or even afterwards for the employee, and both are not really. Um, situations you want to explain to your uh, client. So the client has really, as an employer, as well as the employee, 
to plan those cases in advance and take care the <clears throat> the amount of income from employment is allocated already within the payroll structure to the right country great thank you julian we have just under just about 10 minutes left so i'm going to ask you to kind of quickly go through the next two topics and we'll start with the united states and when what are the payroll issues you know social taxes social insurance taxes and totalization agreements yeah so uh thank you kimberly so in the united states the general rule of thumb is is you know when is u.s payroll required it's generally if you are employing a u.s per, uh, person located and working in the united states they will have a withholding obligation in the united states um, especially when they have a work permit and uh and they're you know coming here to work uh they will have a, a withholding obligation and and sometimes that may even be required for a foreign company to register to register with the united states in order to to withhold uh which can kind of get complicated and we can help guide you through that process the same is required for u.s social security um if they're here the general rules is they're going to be subject to social security tax however um there is like income tax treaties there is a social tax treaty out there that which is called or referred to as a totalization agreement um so if you are in a uh if the united states has a totalization agreement with a foreign country then sometimes we can get out of the social security withholding requirement by filing what they call it a certificate of coverage and what that generally is is if you have a company that's sending uh, a foreign uh, a non-us company sending an employee to a u.s company and you want to keep them on home country payroll that's when usually a, a certificate of coverage would come into play uh where you would keep them on us or home country payroll and have them continue to contribute to the home country social tax regime and that would exempt them on, under the totalization agreement from u.s social security requirements so that's generally how this works with uh payroll and uh totalization agreements in the united states oh what one last thing before we a totalization agreement is something that also it usually lasts it, it lapses after five years in the united states Okay, going quickly through Germany. Sorry, I was putting me off mute. Um, well, the only thing we have to think in Germany is that sometimes when, for instance, only a few uh, workers are sent to Germany to work in a home office, this is a very much uh, um, uh, given case that the employer from abroad thinks they have automatic payroll system here. Well, they don't and then the employee has to apply for voluntary prepayments directly with the income tax and a similar effect to those uh, to the one that Kevin has mentioned comes that the employee has to pay tax where he hasn't really derived income yet so it's sometimes a bit difficult to install and to take in advance the totalization agreements we have here uh, it's similar to the one we have um, in the United States. That's very similar. So I can give up to Jared again. Oh no, it's Kevin. Thanks, Julianne. I'll be very brief. I think the UK is a mirror of the other two countries. Uh, the obligation for payroll taxes will generally rest with the employer, but it can come down to the employee in certain circumstances. Uh, the treaty will often guide us to the outcome for deducting payroll taxes. Other quick issues regarding Social Security, the UK has, uh, similar to what Jared was saying, uh, treaty relief positions for Social Security. I believe the UK is also five years, but um, I'm not entirely sure that it extends beyond that for European countries, or, or certainly for this calendar year anyway. Um, and the last thing to remember in the UK is we don't recognise certain other allowances that other countries do when people are being mobilized 
So you do need to consider the benefits code and whether there is a PAYE obligation as a result of, uh, say, per diems or round sum allowances or attendance allowances being paid to the individual as part of their salary package. Uh, well, that was a quick whistle stop tour, but we'll go on to the next slide. Great. And we'll finish up with kind of what are the other considerations that residents of your country need to think about as they plan to live and work there? Uh, Julianne, you want to start us off? Yeah, sure. Well, one is the exit taxation. I mentioned um, on my one of my first fly, uh, slides um, and just take into consideration when a national has lived here for longer than 10 years or if it's a German national moving to a low tax countries, then the German might take a grip more than on a limited taxation basis. And one word for social security contributions. As I said, the and as mentioned by Jared, there are often to totalization agreements applying. And if the respective employee may show a respective um, certificate of coverage, then it's fine. However, please take into account the Germans have five ways of social security contributions. So five different sorts of contributions and you need, as an employee, a relief for all five ways. That's it for Germany. Yikes. Okay, Kevin. Yes, I th the slide probably pretty much said all, really. The first thing I would say, and it's a boring topic, but you must remember your, there might be other country reporting taking place when you leave. Uh, I mentioned FATCA and CRS in, in the brackets there. Very important, you don't forget about those. Pension planning, because the UK attracts uh, its marginal rate of relief on income, pension planning can be a very sensible way to mitigate UK income taxes. Um, linked to that point is don't forget, whilst it might be an exempt income whilst you're in the UK, let's say you might have a, an exemption from certain investment types or whatever, it may not be exempt in the country where you're going back to. So temporarily you may benefit whilst in the UK from certain exemptions, but you may lose them when you leave. Um, consider your national insurance position in the UK. Um, there are many benefits from social security payments and sometimes it is beneficial to actually pay them here. Um, and the other thing I just want to quickly touch on is, is if you're a small company, if your employee is doing things in this country, and it'll be the same for the others, if they trigger what we define as a permanent establishment for that company, then you're creating a little branch in the UK and therefore locally you'll have to report a balance sheet and profit and loss statement and potentially pay tax as well on the corporate profits. Okay, and Jared. I'll move over to Jared. Yeah. All right, so uh, a lot of the same considerations that were just talked about by both Julianne and Kevin are also considerations for the, the US as well, like permanent establishment. Uh, if you wanna exit the country, the U.S. and no longer be a citizen of the U.S. or or resident of the, or a green card holder. There's also an exit tax you have to. So those are a couple things that that are not on this slide that uh, that, that that are very important topic. But um, determining what kind of reporting requirements are for uh, somebody that meets residency or a U.S. citizen or green card holder uh, is a big deal. So uh, international information reporting that I alluded to earlier. If you have foreign bank accounts, if you have ownership in, when I say foreign, I mean non-US, so non-US bank accounts, if you have uh, ownership of non-US entities, partnerships, corporations, disregarded entities, um, if you have ownership or beneficiary of non-US trusts, um, then there's a, there's a lot of international informational reporting. The penalties are not, the penalties associated for failure to file are generally start off at $10,000. Like for a foreign bank account, it's a $10,000 penalty per account per year, failure to file. So the civil penalties are huge. And then if you start, think, if the IRS thinks you're non-willful in your failure to file, then there could be criminal penalties associated or or increase civil penalties. Uh, so this is really a huge area. Um, if you um, are run awry of these law, rules and laws, the IRS has, the Internal Revenue Service has in, implemented uh, amnesty programs for people to come clean and help file 
and get caught up without uh, being stuck with those penalties or big portion of those penalties. So that's the point I wanted to talk about on other considerations today. Right. Yeah, those penalties are huge and they come fast. I would ask if you have any questions to please send them to tax at hlb.global. That will get to the International Tax Committee and someone will get back to you. You can also reach out to any of our panelists. This webinar and our previous 11 webinars are available at www.hlb.global slash tax. We cover everything from um, guilty and fitty, which are new, which were new laws for the US. We covered sales tax through Wayfair. There's a webinar on transfer pricing. There are two on Brexit. We've talked about indirect taxation, tax incentives for IP, navigating Africa's deals climate, taxation of cryptocurrency, permanent establishment, and the EU mandatory disclosures. So there's just a lot of information out there at hlb.global slash forward slash tax. I would like to take this time to really thank Kevin and Jared and Julianne for their excellent work and helping you understand global mobility and how tax residency plays into individuals moving between countries and how they need to handle their taxes. Again, any questions, tax at hlb.global. And thank you very much. This concludes our webinar.